All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We are here with Dr. Brandon P. Cook for another Museum Time Machine this week, Destination Zambia. Um, just a quick reminder that we are live on Facebook, so we uh, welcome questions through there. You can ask questions on Zoom using the Q&A feature. And we are also recording this and it will go up on YouTube later this afternoon. So um, welcome Brandon again and let's go on our field trip to Zambia. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Hey everybody, uh, good to see you guys again. Back from the first time we did this and we went to Antarctica. Uh, today we're gonna go to a place that is significantly warmer than Antarctica. In fact, it's a pretty hot place. Um, so, for those of you who maybe don't know me, I started just six months ago at the Idaho Museum of Natural History at Idaho State. So I'm the new paleontologist, digging up dinosaurs and all that kind of stuff. And so a lot of paleontologists in the world don't do anything with dinosaurs at all. They look at other kinds of life. But I actually am somebody who, not all the time, but sometimes actually does study dinosaurs. So one of the things I'm the most interested in is the first dinosaurs, sort of where they came from and the context of how they evolved when they first showed up. And so when you want to study questions in paleontology, you're really restricted, sort of like what I talked about if you saw me in Antarctica. You know, you have to go to parts of the world where the right rocks are preserved to answer the questions you're trying to ask. So some of the only rocks in the world that can help us ask questions about the first dinosaurs are in parts of Africa. That's one of the reasons I go there. So this big, nice, I hope you're enjoying it, photo you're seeing on this slide. This is one of our camps. Um, and we're looking out over one of the famous African sunsets. And the sunrises, of course, are very good, too. They're almost always nice and orangey red. So it's, it is like that, which is pretty cool. And so I hope that gives you a sense of what it's like there. So we're just sitting around in tents, you know, driving our cars. It's our normal tents that we bring from home. So you guys probably have tents like this. And we're just out in the African bush. So there's elephants and there's lions and there's crocodiles. I mean, everything like that is right there where we are. So a lot of our sites are actually in the national parks in Zambia, which if you don't know Zambia, that's a country in Africa. It's highlighted there on the right side of your screen. It's kind of in the middle. But okay, let's dive right in and start talking about some cool stuff. So I broke this talk up to tell you guys about sort of the people that are involved, the work that we do, the fossils we find, and I wanted to start talking about the science. So like, what, what is it we're doing in Africa to begin with? I always use this picture because I think this is one of the best pictures of me ever taken. It's totally candid and I look totally awesome. So I use it all the time. So that's me and another researcher, he's from Chicago, and then a, a guy who is one of our really close friends, he works for the Zambian government uh, there behind us. And so what's strapped to that log that we cut down is inside that plaster jacket. So we take plaster to wrap up a fossil when we find it, so the fossil will stay safe. We can get it back to the museum in one piece. Uh, that's a skull of a really big mammal relative. It's an herbivore, so nothing too scary, but it's a really big skull. It's a new species, which is really cool. It doesn't have a name yet, but this is a picture of us pulling it up out of the bush. Um, this was from two years ago, from 2018, so almost exactly two years ago, actually. So what are we doing in Africa to begin with? Well, some of you probably know that the Earth has all these periods. That's how geologists cut up the Earth's history so we can all talk about it and know what we're talking about. And so you might recognize these two names, two of the periods from the last 500 million years. One's the Permian. The Permian comes first and it lasts from about 299 million years to about 252 million years ago. And then the period that comes after that is the Triassic period. And I put a big red line down the middle of the screen because one thing we can learn from the fossil record is we can learn about these time events that are really scary and sad and awful called mass extinction events. And mass extinction events is an event where a lot of different kinds of organisms, plants and animals of all kinds, all die at the same time or in a really short amount of time. So there's always things evolving and always things going extinct sort of as a background, but all throughout Earth history. But there's certain times that we've been able to see where it's like, oh wow, things got really bad for a short period of time and a lot of stuff went extinct. And between the Permian and the Triassic is the biggest one we've ever, ever been able to record. Um, and so here's some pictures of some plants and animals that lived in the Permian and the Triassic. You might recognize in the Permian period that thing with the big sail on its back, that's Dimetrodon. It's, people often call it a dinosaur or something. It's actually one of our cousins, it's a mammal relative. There's things like trilobites. Trilobites are one of the things that actually goes extinct. They die out. They're gone forever after this Permian extinction event. They don't go into the Triassic, but they were around for so long before that. And then in the Triassic period, there's a bunch of animals that evolve that sort of take, uh, take the world upon themselves, and they are the ones that diversify. And so the next period after the Triassic is the Jurassic and then the Cretaceous. So you guys probably know those. 
Those are dinosaur times. And so in the Triassic period is when dinosaurs first show up. Same thing for like uh, some of the spiraled ammonites and corals and you know all kinds of other animals too. It's not just dinosaurs. And so that white animal on the picture there, that's an early dinosaur relative. Unfortunately, it's got its leg taken. So I don't think it's gonna make it. But anyway, that's the Permian and the Triassic. And so those are the two time periods I'm personally the most interested in. So even though I work at the museum here and we find a lot of things like bison and mammoth, those are really cool. My research is about this period particularly. So I was talking about mass extinction events and here's just a pretty simple diagram of something I'm kind of talking about. So if you imagine time moving on your screen from the left-hand side of your screen all the way to the right-hand side of your screen, those black lines are supposed to represent different kinds of life on earth and they're diversifying and evolving and new species are showing up. And then that red box is a pretty short amount of time where a lot of them go extinct and they are gone forever. But there's always a few things that survive. And so some of those black lines you see kind of pass through the red. And then in the next period, which in this case is the dark blue, um, the survivors are the ones that diversify and become new things. And so these are these events that, you know, geologists, paleontologists like me, biologists, or even looking at just like a farm field, you know, we call these turnover events. It's when different kinds of animals and plants replace another in the same place. And so mass extinction events are some of the biggest examples of those turnovers. And so I wanted to talk about the end of the Permian and the mass extinction that happened then, because like I said a minute ago, it's the worst one we know about. It, take out, it took out life of all different kinds all over the world. And when I say all different kinds, I'm talking about all the things you're seeing on the screen. So if you look at this screen, you can see I'm talking about plant eaters, that's like the big green guys, uh, and meat eaters. I'm talking about animals that live on the ocean, animals that live in land, animals that can swim, animals that stay on the bottom of the ocean, and then things like animals that move around, like trilobites or the predator at the top, or animals that don't move, that long, tall thing that looks like a plant, that's a starfish relative called a crinoid, and it stays rooted in place, like kind of like a coral stays in one place. And so you can think about a biologist looking at all these different animals, and so things that move versus things that can't, things that are on land versus things in the sea, things that are in the, eating meat versus things that are eating plants. These are all different ways we can talk about different kinds of animals on earth and if all of them are going all extinct at one time that's really remarkable because that means there's something that's so much bigger than all of them like you can imagine if you take away a bunch of the plants okay maybe you'll lose some plant eaters but why would you lose the trilobites you know so this is a really big and scary event and so we actually know a lot about now um, what happened and how it all probably went down and so all those things will go extinct at once um, this graph i know i'm sorry you're going to see a bunch of graphs today um, is time. So time is going from left to right from 600 million years ago to zero. We, you and me, are living right now at zero. You're watching the zoom at zero. And then the thing on that's not going up and down on the y-axis, the one that's going up and down, that's like one measure of how many things are around. And this is a very old graph. And it's talking about how diverse, how many, how many kinds of animals are living in the oceans. And you can see it goes up, and then there's a couple times when it goes down. And the down are these mass extinction events. And I think you can all probably see that the biggest time it goes down is at the Permian and the Triassic boundary. So if you look at the bottom of the graph, you can see where there's a P and there's kind of a funny T. That's that extinction event. And so that's what happened. That's when it happens. And we pretty sure we pretty much get what happened. Some people have a lot of really interesting research questions about some of the specifics of how certain things went extinct. But the big driver of all of the extinction is a humongous amount of volcanic activity, volcanoes erupting in what's now Russia. So what's now like Siberia, if you know where Russia is. And so if you go to Siberia today, there are these huge black mountains. And those mountains are made out of miles thick lava deposits that were all put out in a really short amount of time. And so I'm not talking about volcanoes like a cone that goes like you make in a school science fair or like Mount Rainier or something like that. I'm talking about like the earth was kind of cracked a little bit and it's like an oozing flow of lava. So we call those traps and there's no active traps on earth today. You cannot go see one. Hawaii's not one, Yellowstone's not one. There was one only 15 or so million years ago that is in uh, Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington. So there's rocks like that in Eastern Oregon and Washington, but that's the last time something like this has really happened. So humans have never really even seen this. We've just seen records of it in the rocks. And so these volcanoes not only are, you know, burning everything that's near them, but that's not really the problem. The problem is, is what they're releasing into the atmosphere. So they're releasing all kinds of gases, things like simple things like greenhouse gases, which are gonna help really warm the planet over, over the long term, but also things like sulfur compounds, and those are 
chemicals that can make the earth very cold for a short period of time. So it's very unstable. And we see all kinds of signals in the ocean. The ocean gets more acidic from all the stuff that the volcanoes are pumping out into the atmosphere. And so there's all these awful things that I won't get into all of them that all sort of circle back on each other and make this very complicated situation. And most life just can't hack it. It's too tough. And so most things go extinct. So it's a pretty intense time. Um, and of course, as humans, we really need to know a lot about what happens when you change the atmosphere too fast, because that's exactly what we're doing today, which is something to you know keep your eye on. Anyway, so back in the Triassic, this is pretty much what the world looks like. So you guys, if you came to my talk on Antarctica, uh, you've probably seen a map like this before. Anybody know what this is? I know you can't tell me, but I'm hoping you're all just yelling it out. So that's Pangaea, right? So it's kind of this big old mash of all the continents. And so I put some stars on Pangaea and those stars represent the different places where I go to dig up fossils and look out about the Triassic period. So the yellow star is South Africa, the blue star is Zambia, which is what I'm gonna talk about the most today, and the red star is Tanzania. So, uh, and those are in Eastern Africa. Pocatello is kind of, I don't know if you can see my mouse, Pocatello is like up here, almost on the ocean, just like it was when I talked about Antarctica. It's the same kind of map. <laughs> So here we are, towards the equator in a desert near the ocean. Not really the Idaho we know now. Um, but anyway, one thing that's really exciting, and the reason me and all my colleagues, we go to Africa, is because between these three different countries, there's actually a lot we can learn about how life was living and evolving before the mass extinction event. And then the mass extinction event happens. That's the really dark line you're seeing there. And then if you look on that chart, there's numbers that are like millions of years of time. So the 265 going all the way up. And so at 252, that's when there's this big extinction event. And so South Africa as a country has had paleontology for a long time and they know a whole lot about their record. And so the South African record is really complete. We can talk about how things changed from this step to this step to this step. It kind of forms the backbone of what we know about the Permian and the extinction and then the Triassic. But in Zambia and Tanzania, which are the blue and the red, we actually don't have that clear a picture because our work there is really new. There hasn't really been that much done. And so the reason some of these are colored is because the places in Tanzania and Zambia where I've gone, we're pretty sure the rocks in Zambia, like say that blue one that says upper assemblage, we're pretty sure it's the same age as the subzone C one in South Africa. And so if we have a really good idea of South Africa and then we take Zambia and Tanzania and plug in rocks that we think are the same age, we can talk about how life looks different across Pangaea or how it looks the same. And so that's kind of the study system we're working with there. Um, so here's a little zoomed in just to give you guys a little geography. So when we go to Africa, this is where we're going. So there's these countries, Zambia and Tanzania, I've already said about a hundred times. And then Malawi is another country. And then there's also one of the big African rift lakes you may have heard about, that's Lake Malawi also called Lake Nyasa on this map. And so the dark patches within the countries are the basins. So places where there has been a rifting and so the earth has opened a little bit, not in a scary way. And then sediments have eroded into it and trapped animals and plants and fossilized them. So that happens all the time. So the Ruhuhu Basin and the Luangwa Basin, those are fun names to say. It's one of the cool things about going to Africa. You get to say all these fun words all the time. They are preserving the same kinds of plants and animals at the same time kind of successively. And so if you imagine, they kind of give us like two test cases on some of the questions we might have about the extinction or things that happened afterwards. But anyway, uh, more later. Oh yeah, here's all the places we've been. I didn't say this, but we've gone a lot of times. I've been there a lot of times. So I've been there and we go there and I'm mostly talking about Zambia today. So these are all the Zambian stars. Um, so the mid Luongo Basin, the one star in the middle there, in 2018 and 2019, I got a grant from the National Geographic Foundation, and we got to go do a bunch of work there and answer a bunch of questions I'm going to tell you guys about. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, so what are those questions that we're talking about? So I'm showing you guys the real stuff now. This is like scientific literature. This isn't like cool pictures of fossils, although I'm going to show you cool pictures of fossils. This is like telling you like the real science that's really like brand new stuff. So this was a paper that we published to share with other scientists um, a couple years ago. And so what we were trying to do was talk about the different kinds of animals and how similar the different places on the world were to one another before the extinction and then after the extinction. And so there's the extinction, that big red line. So beforehand, you guys can see all those little dots. And so I, you don't really have to know everything about those dots, but I'm gonna ask you a question and hopefully you can talk to your, each other. So the brown ones are the different places. So Luangwa is the Zambian place. So the brown is the places. And then all the other dots are different kinds of animals. 
And so a white dot that's connected to a brown dot means that that dot, that animal only lives in that place. And then a yellow dot is usually, is always connected to more than one brown dot. And that means that animal is shared. It lives in both places or all three places or all four places. And so I think if you look at the one on the top and the one on the bottom, which are for the most part the same places, but the only thing that's different is we've gone over this extinction event. Are there more yellow dots above or are there more yellow dots below? We did a bunch of fancy math on this. We didn't just count the dots, but you guys can just probably get the idea. Right? So there's a lot of yellow dots below hand. And so that is what we interpret as scientists to mean that before the extinction, there's lots of these animals that are kind of shared between all these places. They all, no matter where you go, um, you know, in Africa or maybe South, South America or something, it's going to be pretty much the same animals living the same kind of way. And that makes sense. And then this extinction happens and a lot of stuff dies. And then afterwards, a lot of new stuff evolves and the ecosystems you find afterwards are made of different animals. But because maybe we think you sort of shattered, you broke the stability of what was going on beforehand, is that now all of these places look different from each other. Even though we think they're all the same age, there's different animals in Zambia, there's different animals in South Africa, there's different animals in Tanzania. And why that's really cool is that only in Tanzania and now only recently a little bit in Zambia do you have things like the first dinosaurs. South Africa, we know so, so, so much about. Look how many white dots are around. That the Karoo is, Karoo is the one that's South Africa, so the bottom there. So the, in the Triassic, all the white dots on Karoo, we, we, have, we know a lot about that place. There's no dinosaurs there. We don't know very much about Zambia and Tanzania comparatively, but there's definitely things that are interesting about dinosaur evolution there. And so what's the story is, after these ecosystems get broken up, they evolve in different ways, and in some of those ways, it really important animals are showing up. So that's kind of what the research is really getting after. And so this was our question, was trying to get after uh, what those ecosystems look like. And so this is that big list of names up at the top there are people I worked with to do this. But all of these uh, graphs are saying like, does this animal live in this place? Yes or no? And that's as simple as the question is. And I think you guys know that animals are more complicated than whether they live in a place or not. Some animals are worms and some animals are elephants. And you know, one's big, one's small, one eats plants, one eats meat. There's all kinds of different ways to talk about it. And so when I was getting my PhD before I came here, one thing I did was I went to all these red stars all over this map are places where there's natural history museums, just like the Idaho Museum of Natural History. And on this chart you're seeing over there, you don't have to read the whole chart, are all of these expeditions, mostly colonial expeditions actually, that went to Tanzania and Zambia in the 1920s, 1930s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and they took fossils from those countries and they brought them back to their museums. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff we could talk about there if you wanted to. But what I did was I had to go to all those museums because me and my collaborators, me and my friends, we collected our own fossils, but there's also a ton of fossils other people had collected before us. So I was really lucky. And if you ever decide to do some science, you'll probably get to be very lucky too. And if you like traveling, you oftentimes get to do a lot of traveling because I have to go to London and Paris and Cape Town to see all these fossils. And so I did, um, but we'll skip that for now. Actually, I'll show it to you because I think it's funny. When you go to natural history museums, you get to look through all the old records. So if you come to the Idaho Museum of Natural History, we have records of you know, everything that people have collected for us and found the big bison and things like that. So we have their notes. And I was in Cambridge, which is a very fancy university in Britain in the United Kingdom. And I found this hilarious telegram from the 1930s Whereas this geologist who was in the, the, the colony at the time, it wasn't even a country, it wasn't even called Tanzania yet. And he had found a bunch of fossils. And so all the scientists were like, oh, okay, we'll go get the fossils. And so they asked the geologist to come help them. And he wrote back, no, I can't help you. I'm gonna be collecting gold. And gold is in all capital letters, I think you can see with a bunch of exclamation points that some person on the telegraph machine had to like write in. And so I thought this was really funny because sometimes when you're doing work and you're looking at old people's records you know from decades ago or 100 years ago you know you just think of them as like stiff people in photographs and i think it's really funny to see a telegraph where this guy's being like nah i can't help you i gotta go find gold <laughs> it's just really fun okay anyway sorry for that so when i went to these museums and if you come to the idaho museum of natural history you can also see lots of fossils like this probably not permian and triassic fossils because that's not what we find here in idaho but scientists who are studying animals like mammoths or mountain lions or some kinds of dinosaurs even, they come to our museum and do what I did, which is like look at the specimens and collect scientific information. 
And so here's two skulls. I don't know if you know what they are. We'll talk about that later. Don't worry about all the words on there. It doesn't matter. But the point is, is I had to spend months in just dusty basements measuring things and looking at things so I could build pictures of what these ecosystems looked like. And just to make you get sort of like, oh my God, this is a picture of one of the back rooms at the museum in Cambridge that I went to. And every single one of those gray crates weighs like 50 pounds or something. And it's just full of rocks and Ziploc bags that I had no idea. The people who went to Africa back in like the 30s and then again in the 60s, they collected a bunch of stuff. Some of it's very beautiful. It's on display in their museum. But these crates are just full of Ziploc bags of bones that nobody ever did anything with. And so I didn't know I had to look through all that too. And it was like crazy. But what's funny is sometimes looking through the stuff that nobody's looked at very much yields big surprises. So new things are found in museums all the time. And so here's this picture I took in Cape Town. So that's in South Africa, which is it's a very cool place. Um, those five rock looking things are not rocks at all. They're the top of skulls. If you can see, they, both, they all look like they kind of have a depression. You're looking at like the top of the skull, but from the bottom. And so those depressions are where the eyeballs would be on these totally weird animals called Biermasukians. They're mammal relatives, they're cousins of ours, but they have like all these horns and knobs and frills on their head. And they're really rare. There's only like 30 some skulls in the whole world. And then in like a shoebox in a basement in South Africa, I found five more. They're not very good, they're all broken up, but like still we know what they are. And so I got to go up into the curator's office in South Africa and he was like on the phone and I was holding all these and I like knock on the door and then I just point at them. And he's like, what? Where did you get those? And they've been in his, they've been in the building with him for 85 years or something. And so I'm sure, you know, hey, I'm a curator too. So if you guys ever come to the museum and look through the collections doing research, I'm sure you'll find stuff that I'll be like, oh wow, I didn't know we had that. That happens all the time. Anyway, here's these big scary lists that I don't expect you to look at. But all the work that I did was try to get an idea of, so what do these places look like? So for instance, here's the Permian in Tanzania, and here's the Permian in Zambia. And so you can see these gigantic lists of all the different kinds of animals all identified. Oh, that's so much work. And then how many of each one? So 15 of this, 20 of that, only one of this thing. And then specimen numbers for how big they get, what, an estimate of how much they weighed, what they ate. And so rather than just looking at like, does it live in this place, yes or no, I was trying to look at um, the whole ecosystem, all these different ways of measuring what kinds of animals are running around on the landscape. And so now this is the last of the graphs, I promise. So, oh, this is the same thing for the Triassic when the first dinosaurs are really showing up. Um, oh wait, no, I gave you guys a, I gave us a break first. So we're gonna look at fun fossils. So before we start talking about all the sciencey stuff, or sorry, the uh, like graphs of some of the stuff I found for when I was doing my degree, I wanna show you some real fossils first. So this is Joseph again. He was the guy in the background uh, when I was carrying that log. And he's holding something that he found just loose. We're walking in a dry river. So it's the dry season. There's no water you can see behind him. The water's all gone for this year. We have to wait for the rains again. And he's found there's tons of rocks. And one of those rocks looks like that. Uh, you guys can say in the chat, does anybody see what he's holding? Does anybody recognize anything? And it's cool if, if you don't. I'll just tell you in a minute. Or two. Someone says a claw. Mm. Are you saying a claw because of this thing? <laughs> right here I think too. So, yeah. But look, but look, you said a claw. That's not a bad guess. So it's not a claw. But look at here's this one. And then this one is on the other side. So this is the two sides. So it's there's one on either side. So believe it or not, this is actually a skull and a lower jaw. Can you see my mouse? If I move my mouse around, is my mouse visible? Okay, so this is an eyeball. This is the nostril, the nose. And then this is a great big tusk. And then this is a lower jaw all the way down here. And so over here, here's the lower jaw, here's the tusk, here's the eyeball, and here's the nose. And so that's an animal called a dicynodon. And so maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't. Here's what the animals look like in the Permian. So there's no dinosaurs here. This is before dinosaurs show up. And so animals like this one down here, this one right here, this one right here, this one right here, 
These are dicynodonts. So these are mammal relatives. They're our cousins. And they were the most diverse and most abundant. They were everywhere in the Permian period, all over the world. You can find them everywhere. They're like the, the plant eaters. There's really cute tiny ones. There's really big, great big ones. That's what's running around is these dicynodonts. And so maybe you guys haven't seen those before, but they're pretty cool. This one down here has tusks. You can see the little tusks on the bottom. And so that's what you saw in that last picture. Aren't these guys weird? They've got beaks. Some of them don't have any teeth except for their tusks. They're super bizarre. Anyway, the other things they, oh, q and q and a. Why do they have such complicated names? Ooh, let's, let's talk about that. Di, sino, dont. Di is just two, means two. Sino is dog, so like two, uh, that well, just means dog. And then don, like an orthodontist, is tooth. So this thing, they call it two dog teeth is all what that name means, di-sino-dont. And that's because of those tusks, because dogs kind of have canines. I don't think they really look very doggy, but whatever. <laughs> don't ask me, someone made it up in the 1800s. Um, the other animals on the screen are the predators. So there's some big chunky reptiles, like this big, big guy, big fat guy over here. But there's also these carnivores that are really awesome saber-toothed animals. And so we're gonna have an exhibit in the fall called Skulls, and you guys are gonna get to see some really awesome skulls of these guys. Anyway, I was trying to learn about the whole ecosystem, right? So one of the things I was interested in was the diet. And so how do I know about diet in fossil animals? You can't catch them and look in their stomachs or whatever. So one of the fun things about the record in Zambia and in Tanzania is there's really good records of uh, things being eaten. They're really rare to find, but there are a couple. So this is a beautiful skeleton. It's a totally complete skeleton. It's from Tanzania. It's in Germany now of this animal called a Gorgonopsian. The Gorgonopsians, we can just call them Gorgons. They're the animals eating the dicynodonts. And how do I know that? Well, this one had a small, there's the word dicynodont, had a small dicynodont in its stomach all chewed up as a fossil. So the predator is dead and is a fossil and in its stomach is a chewed up prey item. And so when I'm doing my science and I'm like, I think Gorgonopsians ate little dicynodonts. Well, here's a fossil that's like, yup, they definitely did. So that helps me be more confident about other things I might Here's one more example that's really cool. So this is a leg bone, a femur, right? So just like your thigh bone of a dicynodont from the Triassic period. So not all the dicynodonts actually go extinct at the extinction. So in the Triassic, there are still some dicynodonts. And if you look, there's holes in the femur. And when they found it in the 1960s, one of the paleontologists, he decided to pour plaster into all of those holes. So it looked like that. And they kept it in the museum with the specimen. And then when you pull the plaster out, the plaster is the shape of big sharp teeth that are curved backwards. And so by the time the Triassic is happening, there are big crocodile relatives and early dinosaurs running around. And so it looks like this leg bone got bit pretty hard by one of the big crocodile guys. And so what's cool is even in the fossil record, we can paint pictures like this, which are kind of gruesome sometimes, I know, but it's pretty cool because that crocodile relative biting that dicynodont's left or right leg, right leg, and that Gorgonopsian swallowing a dicynodont mostly whole, we have fossils to show us that that really happened. And that's really cool. And so all the plants in this image are, you know, the right kind of plants that we find in that area. And so I think it's really fun when we use all these different lines of evidence to really show people like some really true thing from the past. Don't those Gorgons look scary, the ones on the left? They're, very, they're the first big saber-toothed animals. So they're not cats or anything, but they're, oof. You'll see one at the exhibit in the fall. Okay, so this is the last of the science, I promise. So all that information that I had just collected, everything I just told you guys all about, here's all the comparison between the three places. So remember we said that like, with all those dots being connected to each other. So in the Permian, before the extinction, everything was the same pretty much everywhere you went, but we were only asking animals yes and no. Here's a different way of looking at the same information, well, a lot more information actually, and finding really good support for that conclusion. So the yellow, the blue, and the red are South Africa and Zambia and Tanzania, just like before. And then what you're seeing on the left-hand side is the relative abundance. So of all the animals that lived in South Africa, say, how many of them were dicynodons? How many of them were gorgons? How many of them were amphibians? Whatever it is. And if you look, at all three places in terms of the different kinds of animals and the different 
body size and diet categories, which are on the bottom. So like the niche, big herbivores, small, tiny carnivores, things like that. That's the drumstick and the fern. I hope you can see that they all look really the same. In all three places, dicynodonts are the ones that are the most common, and then gorgons are next, and then these animals called parareptiles are next after that. And then when it comes to what size and what everybody's eating, most abundant are the medium herbivores, and then the large herbivores, and then the tiny herbivores, and then the medium predators. It's just blah, 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 kind of boring. But the point is, all these three places are showing the exact same signal. It all looks the same. That's really cool. So that's showing us that these ecosystems really were, you know, the same species and the animals are all doing the same stuff. It's totally cool. Um, we're gonna skip this one, but whatever. Here's the animals in the Triassic period. So these ones maybe are a little more familiar in some ways, I wonder. So there's still some dicynodonts. Here's one, here's one, you can see the tusks. There's a couple really big gigantic amphibians. If you guys came to my Antarctica talk, I talked about gigantic amphibians. Those live everywhere in the Triassic. Some of our, our mammal cousins, things that are close to mammals, look a lot more mammally in the Triassic. So these things up here at the top are called cynodonts. So not dicynodonts, just cynodonts. So Cormac, that just means dog tooth, right? So cynodonts up here. They look kind of like us, they're fuzzy. And then there's these other animals that I'm the most excited about. So there's these crocodile relatives, which aren't in the water. They're not like swimming crocodiles like today. They live on land. They're big, scary predators. And then there's this thing, which is one of the earliest relatives of dinosaurs. Super exciting. We don't find that in South Africa. It's only in Zambia and Tanzania. And then this guy's really fun. I'm not going to talk about it too much. But this might look like a dinosaur to you guys. It's not. It's a very weirdo, bizarro crocodile relative that walks on two legs and doesn't have any teeth and has a beak. It's insane. And we'll talk about it later if you want. Anyway, here's another set of these graphs for the end of the talk, of the science anyway. And so I hope you can see, just, just remembering what you saw two slides ago, that in the Triassic period, when things look like they're different and there's not as many animals shared between the different places, the kinds of animals in each place are totally different. It's not the same order of like this one, this one, this one, this one are the most common. Every single place is different. And that's true with what the animals are. Are they, you know, dinosaur relatives? Are they dicynodonts? That's true with like big herbivore, small carnivore, whatever. It's totally broken. So this extinction, we think, broke that similarity, all the different ways you can measure it. And then by the Triassic, every place is different. And so one of the different things that's happening that we all care about is the evolution of things like dinosaurs. So super cool. And thanks for, you know, bearing with me when I showed you actual like scientific figures, which are like not the most fun. But anyway, that was all my work um, before uh, a year or so ago. And then we decided to go back to uh, Zambia and answer a bunch of questions. And so actually looking at the time, I'm gonna skip past these questions because who cares? We just wanna look at fun stuff. Um, yeah, we're gonna skip all of it. This is what it looks like, by the way. This is all from satellite footage. So this is, I hope you guys can see, do you guys, well, actually, I'll ask. Does anybody, look at this, Pat, look at this for a minute and tell me if you see anything. Like, what, what do you notice about this satellite imagery? We're looking at the rocks that the fossils are in. Um, and so whenever I used to go there, you guys talk to each other about that. Whenever we used to go there, we would always just drive around. It's very hard to get around. Um, you're on dirt roads for 100 miles and there's you know no civilization there's no like buildings and stuff because we're in the national parks um and it's really hard to know where you are there's not big badlands like in montana or in you know wyoming or something it's all just like scrubby forest and so we find the fossils in these little patches on the ground and so it's really hard to know where you are in the geological series like what layer you're in and it's also kind of easy to get lost just in general and so whenever we've gone in the past Usually what happens is there's so many fossils there, it's so good, that we find so many so fast that we go, okay, well that's enough. We don't have enough money to ship all these to America for, for a couple of years to work on them. All the fossils ultimately, by the way, go back to Africa. But the fossils, you know, we find so many, we just go, okay, we stop. And so one of the questions I was getting into uh, right before I came here to Idaho was, you know, are we really looking at these places in a systematic way and trying to figure out where we are? Because mostly we're just finding fossils and being like, oh my God, this is so great, and then going home. So 
Is anybody seeing any patterns or anything they notice in this satellite imagery? Things that look interesting? There's not really wrong answers here. I'm just curious what you might notice. All right, well, somebody comes up with something, maybe we'll come up, maybe we'll talk about it. I noticed, I think, and I think we have always suspected it. Oh, somebody, 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 no. Uh, stripes, you can see that the rocks are kind of going in the, you can see the color of the ground, it looks like it's going in one direction, like layers. Like look at this forest. This forest isn't like a clump, this forest isn't a line. That's weird, right? <laughs> and so we figured out these are the different layers of time. And so these rocks are actually old. These rocks are younger. These rocks are younger. The extinction actually happens somewhere in the forest. That's kind of freaky, right? And then up here above is where we get all the dinosaur fossils and stuff. And so we're figuring out that geology. Anyway, I'm skipping it. I'm just going to show you guys. See, there's my grant, but who cares? Forget it. Oh, there's a picture of the rocks. That's how we knew uh, we finally found some rivers where you could see the rocks. Do you guys notice anything about these rocks when you look at this picture? What's going on with them? And you could actually see some. I'm gonna wait for an answer on this one. Either nobody's watching. Oh, there we go. They're clumped together. Anonymous attendee says, I think that's true. They're clumped together. I see lines. I see lines too, Xavier and Gabe. Um, and the lines are all slanting, right? They're diagonal. That's super cool. And so that helped us figure out, if we figure out, you know, the rocks when they were first laid down were nice and flat. We always assume they're nice and flat. And so if all the rocks are tilted like this, that means we can measure on a map. You know, if we walk this far, if we walk that far, we'll be able to figure out how high or low we are in the rocks, which is a really cool thing. Maybe you guys aren't excited by that, and that's okay. But we were excited because we always felt like we were wandering around. We never knew where we were. Anyway, here's my friend Julia. She's a really good geologist, and she actually found the place where the Permian rocks touch the Triassic rocks, the specific place, which is super cool. That means the extinction happens right in between her legs. And she's a geologist, and so she told me when you find an extinction boundary, you've got to stand over it like that and feel it. It's kind of funny. Anyway. So the things that we're doing now is we're looking for these dinosaur relatives in the Triassic rocks. And so we'd have a grant right now to the National Science Foundation because we want to go back and try to find the first dinosaurs. Anyway, who cares? I didn't leave enough time to talk about it. Let's actually show you guys the good stuff. Let's talk about doing real work in Africa anyway. So here's what it looks like when we're there. No more science and stuff. Here's what it looks like when you're there. These are the outcrops, so the places where we can find fossils. You guys can see some of the patches that look like dirt. That's actually fossil mud, it, well, the fossil mud, it's mud stone. So it was mud back in the Triassic or in the Permian. So you see people sitting all around in different places, they're all poking up different fossils. So let's look at some of the fossils. Anybody recognize anything? Anybody see anything? This is what it looks like when you find one. You know, you're not in a museum, you're out in the wild, you're in the woods. How do you know if you found a fossil or not? This is what they look like when we found them. Anybody have any guesses? Do I see anything? Oh, teeth, teeth. Oh, I love the teeth. Everyone's right. Yes, there's teeth. This right here is a great big tooth, and these are small little teeth. So these are fossils from the Gorgons, the predators from the Permian period. And so these small little things right here are the incisors, the front teeth, like you see on this skull that's in a museum. And then here's the big saber tooth on the side, and here's the big saber tooth in the ground in Zambia. That's pretty cool. What about this thing I found? That's my hand. So we found this thing, we found hundreds of these things, these little like globs. Maybe you don't know what those are. I didn't know what they were when I first found them all those years ago, but they're pieces of armor from these reptiles that lived in the, in the Permian period called pariasaurs. And pariasaurs are really fun. They're kind of like these big reptilian kind of fat cow things. They're about the same size. 
they lived all over the place. And so, yeah, you can see its skin is full of armor. You gotta have a lot of armor. There's gorgons running around. They're gonna bite you with their sabers. So that's pretty cool. What about these pictures? These are all pictures of us digging up different specimens in the Permian. Anybody see anything they recognize? Mm -hmm. Oh, we got leg. Cormac says leg. Like the person's leg? No, I bet you meant the fossil. Yeah, so this right here is a skull. Oh, somebody else? Leg bones. This right here is a skull. And then you can see like tick, 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 tick. That's the backbone. And then here's a shoulder. And then this is part of a limb, so kind of like a leg. This is the arm bone right here. And then this is a head. This is a head. This is a whole body. You can see there's like these symmetrical shapes right here. Would you guys find this? I bet you would. If I took you to Africa, I bet after a couple hours, you'd start finding stuff because you just start noticing the different colors. So this right here is a head seen from above. And then there's all these bones that circle around here. And then yes, there's some leg bones over here. These are all those dicynodons. This is how we find them. You have to dig them out of the ground, be really careful, wrap them up in plaster, get them home, and then they look amazing. And so here's what they would have looked like. Um, oh, this is kind of a funny thing. I don't know if you guys will think this is funny. I thought it was funny. So in the ground here with all the rusty stuff on it is a dicynodont skull. And so these two circles are its tusks. Remember they have the tusks that come out and they're broken off. Okay, so that's a dicynodont. And then because we're in Africa, right nearby, we found the skull of a warthog, like a normal warthog that's alive today. And I think it's funny because warthogs also have tusks. They've got big tusks that come out the side. And so here's these two different animals that are really very not closely related. One lives today, and one lived 255 million years ago. They're about the same size. They both lived in the same place, and they both had tusks. Maybe you don't think that's fun. I thought that was kind of fun. Some people think it's gross. If you think that's gross, here's what we do at our campsites. We always find animal bones, like normal animal bones. If you guys go up on a hike, you might find like an elk or a deer, right? Maybe you'll find an antler. When we're in Africa, you find tortoises and giraffes and warthog skulls and all kinds of crazy stuff. And so I just think this is fun. Here's a nice tree we decorated with all the bones we found. Now let's go into the Jurassic and talk about the fossils there. So I'll go through this pretty quick. So that's me holding a skull. That British guy down there on the bottom left, he just found, you see that thing that's kind of like curved? That's the lower jaw of a big old great amphibian. Um, the picture of me with that silly hat on, that's the big leg bone of one of the Triassic dicynodonts, one of the dicynodonts that lives with mammals, or sorry, ant, well, mammals is true, but also dinosaurs. And then we also find all kinds of other cool stuff in the Triassic. So all of those shells up at the top are fossil clams that lived in the ponds back in the Triassic. And so it's not just animals that like, are like dinosaurs and mammals, right? There's other kinds of animals like the clams. There's also lots of fossil plants. So that's a guy from Chicago. He's sitting there with a really beautiful fossilized log. So fossilized woods, we can talk about the plants that lived in these ecosystems. Anyway, giant amphibians, dicynodonts, that's in the Triassic. There's also these fossils. A lot of the Triassic fossils we find are really tiny, uh, which is really cool because it, it really make, means you have to get like a little microfine glass and sort of look and see if you can figure out what it is. Um, the two things on the left are different kinds of teeth of really uh, interesting animals. The one with like all the little bumps, there's like a lot of little teeth in its mouth. It's a super weird thing, I'll show it to you. But then on the right, that's the stuff where I'm always the most excited. So on the right, that's the leg bone, so the femur bone, of a really early dinosaur relative. And those are so great to find because a lot of what we know about early dinosaurs just happens to come from their legs and their feet and their ankles because those bones are really easy to preserve. You know, their, their heads usually fall apart, which is kind of a funny thing. So the femur, the leg bone, that's really cool. And these are all finds from last, the last couple of years in Zambia, which are helping us put that picture together. There's the weird thing that has the beak and the funny teeth. It's called a rhynchosaur, Cormac, if you want another funny name. It's called a rhynchosaur. Anyway, these are some of the Triassic animals. So this is a place in Zambia that's like one of the most important sites we've ever found. And it doesn't really look that cool, does it? It just looks like a little hill with some dead trees in it. But you know what? 
coming out of that hill, teeny tiny little bones, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teeny tiny little bones of amphibians, of mammals, but most importantly, a lot of the dinosaur relatives. And some of them are teeny tiny. And so one thing that came from in this area is um, the pelvis of an animal that's a dinosaur relative. I actually got to name it. I got to give it that name. If you think that name, Lutunga Tali, if you think that's stupid, well, whatever, I made it up. So now I'm mad at you. Um, also, we got to do all kinds of cool science on how these dinosaurs were growing up, how they were living their lives. So this is kind of a bunch of crazy stuff, but I'll walk you through it. This right here is a really big leg bone. So the same bone, right, the femur. This one that's drawn is drawn because we find a lot of them. And so I just drew an outline of a random one. This is the size of the whole femur of most of the ones that we find. This one you can see is really big, but it's broken. So it's like, it goes all the way down off the screen. That's how long that big one is. And then this little thing here is the actual size of the tiniest little femur we found of a dinosaur thing. So we're like, okay, so does this thing grow up to be like a teen and then go into an adult? Is that what's happening here? So you guys might know that one thing that's really cool about dinosaurs is that they get really big. I bet you did know that. But they also grow up really fast. And so for a reptile, you know, reptiles aren't usually known for growing up really fast. Some of them, of course, do. And dinosaurs are one of those. So we were wondering, right at the beginning of dinosaur evolution, right, at, right when they're first starting, do they already have that ability? Do they already grow up really quickly? And so all those really colorful pictures you're seeing are pictures where we took those bones and we cut them with a saw to be super, super thin, and we glued them to a micro microscope slide, and we could look through the microscope slide and see the cells of their bones, and then figure out how fast the bones were growing. And so like, this is the outside world, and this black here is the inside of the bone, like where the bone marrow is. And then everything in between tells us about, you know, how the bone grew. Because you know, your bone is alive, it's not just like, you know, your bone's not like a rock or something. There's blood and vessels and all kinds of things happening. Right? Nerves. And so we figured out that, yeah, these dinosaurs, early dinosaur relatives, were growing pretty quickly. Not as fast as dinosaurs eventually got, but really fast, which is very cool because it's very unlike the other reptiles they're living with. And so here's just to show you how big they could get. So usually, previous to all of our work, some of the dinosaur relatives people found were as big as that small guy. So you could like kind of hold them like a little dog. But in Tanzania and Zambia, we found some pretty big ones. And so, sorry, I'll just go through this kind of quick. That's kind of what I mean. So previously, we only had kind of small dinosaur cousins, and then some of the first dinosaurs are the ones that got really bigger and bigger and bigger. But it turns out some of the things that are not quite dinosaurs, just close, also got pretty big really early uh, in the group's evolution, which is super cool. Anyway, now I was just gonna show you guys fun pictures, and I guess, do we only have like one or two minutes, or do we have the whole hour? Well, we have the whole hour. You have about uh, 11 minutes. Okay. Then I'll show you guys fun stuff. You wanna see animals, don't you? I mean, come on, it's Africa. We're going yeah. to Zambia, right? That's the picture behind me. That's how we drive around. We have to drive on oil barrels to cross cool rivers. So I just want to show you guys some cool pictures of like field life and expeditions in Africa when we're picking up all these fossils in order to do all this science. So there's us all sitting around the campfire. There's bats everywhere, which I love all kinds of animals. So I'm always love trying to take pictures of bats at night so you can figure out what kind of bat it was later. The Milky Way and the galaxy, everything is just, all the stars are out. It's fantastic. If you're in the middle of nowhere in Africa, there's for sure no lights. And so that's always so cool. Uh, this is what it looks like most of the time when we're driving around. We're all just going single file. That's the road. You know, there's not exits. There's not restaurants. It's like bring all your food with you. And you're just driving around out in the middle of, excuse me, the bush, watching out for animals. It's kind of intense. Uh, here's just some fun pictures. There's me counting out money to pay for all the gas just to fill up our three cars. So that's like one of the biggest uh, 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 denominations of the Zambian currency, which is pretty fun. Uh, that's our scout. Um, when we're in the parks, so we always have a scout with us. You can see he's got like a single action rifle, bolt action rifle. Uh, and that's mostly to scare away animals if they get to be too, uh, too aggressive. There's also poachers he has to worry about. So that's kind of his job too, but um, you know, he's not going to shoot any animals. He's just going to make them run away from us if they get too close. There we are crossing the river. So that's what it was. That's what's in my background here. So every time we go back and forth and back and forth across the river, you just drive onto this thing that these people made. And then that guy in the blue, like, actually pulls us across the river, like, with his own strength while we're floating. It's super crazy. 
I think you can see in the picture, there's a hippopotamus down the river from us. And so we always have to be careful because there's crocodiles and hippos all over. And we have to all like stay in the car or like stay close to the car because you don't want to have one of those come up at you. And also we have all kinds of sad things happen like this awful, awful event. What do you do when you don't get a flat tire, but you really like break your wheel and you're days and days away from anywhere? Well, you have to get creative and I won't tell you what we did. Um, here's where you have to go get your drinking water. So when you're getting thirsty, you gotta have water. So we've got pumps that we use to filter the water to keep it clean. And so this is just this small little patch of water that exists in the dry season. You can see there's footprints all in the mud. There's giant elephant footprints where those people are standing. So everybody comes to use this water, not just us. And so every time we come to it, we have to like throw a bunch of rocks to make sure there's not a crocodile or something. And then we all like take turns like putting the water jug in to get the water to come out. Because you gotta drink water, right? It's so hot. Uh, one time we couldn't really find water. And so we had to do this. So this is on a dry riverbed. And in fact, we did not dig that hole. Elephants dig that hole with their trunks to get the cold water that's hiding under the sand to seep up. And so it was such a pain in the butt to try to get enough water for us to use. We only did it one time and it was such a pain. But it was also really fun to like use the elephant holes. That felt really cool. Oh, we got a cue. What's my favorite dinosaur? Oh gosh, I never know how to answer that question. Um, I'm gonna be predictable. I'm not gonna say something that's all new or whatever. I really like, Brachiosaurus and Parasaurolophus. Always have, can't tell you why, but they're great. <laughs> there we are getting water. That's me taking a bath in the water. I felt like I needed it, but it was also kind of gross. <laughs> now let's talk about all the animals we see. So when we're there, I mean, we're in the national parks, which is super, super fun. Cause I like, you know, I'm a biologist. Like I like fossils and I like the extinct animals, but like I'm all about all the animals that are still alive. So you guys can see this cute little leopard tortoise there trying to hide from us in the grass. There's this cool little turtle. Um, that's me and I found when we were looking for fossils, I just found <clears throat> a loose elephant hip bone. So that's a pretty fun picture. Um, next to my gin and tonic, which you can see there on the left, is nice lion footprints that we found outside of our camp one night, which they weren't there earlier. So that's always exciting. Uh, and then the picture in the middle, I think, is just a really fun picture. So one of the students we had with us last year, she noticed, she's like, guys, what is happening over there? And like 15 feet above the river was just this hippopotamus standing on the edge of this cliff, just like looking down. And it didn't stop looking down. It was just looking down. And we watched it for like 10 minutes and it was just standing there. And we're like, okay, well, we have to go. So we started like packing up our camp and we're like, whatever. And then we just heard this humongous splash. And apparently eventually this hippo decided to jump and it looks like it was fine. But still, I never thought hippopotamuses would like jump off cliffs, but I guess they do that in nature on their own. These are all just pictures that I took out the front windshield last summer when we were there. Um, I always try to tell people, if you can figure it out somehow in your life, if you like being outside, if you like nature, going to Africa somewhere, go to Kenya or South Africa or whatever, it's just the best because there's so many cool animals there. And so this is us just like driving around trying to do our work and you know, come on, giraffes and elephants and zebras and buffalo, it's the best. Um, and it just makes you really feel, I think, uh, very close to nature. And you know, a lot of the world used to look like this. Right in American Falls, you know, there's giant mammoths and giant sloths and lions. I mean, those animals lived here until super recently. But you know, the first indigenous people, the first native people of the Americas saw all animals just like this that lived right here, like right in Pocatello. Uh, and they're just happen to be gone now, which is really sad. So going to Africa, you start to feel like, ah, this is what the world's supposed to be like. It's nice. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is just the people we work with there because they're so great. So these people are called the Tolans, Steve and Anna. They run this wildlife education center. And so he's like a huge fossil enthusiast. He always goes out with us. Um, and they host us at their home, which is so wonderful. Um, and so um, they have children from all over the country come to uh, their home and they have a school at their house and they take kids into the parks and show them all the animals. So it's kind of like if you guys have ever like gone on a trip to Yellowstone or something with your class, it's the same kind of thing, but in Africa. And so this is the education center they have at their home, um, which they run, you know, you know, people come from all over to learn about 
the animals and conservation. You can see there's a warthog that like dug up the flower bed and is sleeping under the sign. That's just like a warthog that lives at their house. Um, and so that's really cool. Uh, and then here's all of us hanging out at their house. They've got such a crazy house because they also run like an animal orphanage and help rehabilitate wild animals. So there's baboons and there's vervet monkeys and that guy with the bandana has got a bush baby on him that lives in their ceiling. There's a warthog under our car. There's this baby hippo that they raised and they actually had to build a wall around their house because the baby hippo kept growing up and then became like a real size hippo and it could open up their front door with its lips. And so they had to stop that. And so they really did build like a huge wall all around their house so the hippo couldn't come inside, which is totally crazy um, and really fun. They also have like a crocodile that just routinely lives in their garden, like in their yard. And they have to like, hey, because there's a crocodile in their yard again, which I think is really fun. Anyway, here's pictures from last year. Um, so you can see there's the hippos again, the baboons. I just like showing these pictures because they're so fun. We all had to go inside at one point though because this big bull elephant just like came out of the woods and like that's their garden pond and like walked right between all of us and all the like, oh, and stay out of his way. But pretty cool thing. So besides the people um, who run the education center that help us, we work really closely with the Zambian government. You know, we're not just flying in and flying out. And so the National Heritage Conservation Commission is this uh, governing force in Zambia that helps conserve all of their like cultural and natural history resources. So there's also the National Park Service, which is the one on the top right, that help guard all the animals and keep the parks open for like you know, tourists and for conservation. You know, they've got to deal with poachers, uh, which is really intense. And it's been fun because we're working with these organizations really closely. Because like I said, all the fossils that we've collected and studied you know, we're trying to include Zambian people within that process, but then also all the fossils are going back to those countries. You know, they don't stay in America. This isn't the world anymore where, you know, you can fly around and take everybody's rocks and keep them for yourself forever. So these all fossils are all going to go back. And so we're working on building exhibits and a museum there. It's really cool because we'll have copies of the fossils that we keep here at the Idaho Museum and in other places in the U.S., but the ultimate fossils go back, which is really cool. I also want to say that when we work in the national parks, there's also this organization, which is the Frankfurt Zoological Society. And so this is this international organization based in Germany, and they're helping reintroduce black rhinoceros to the parks in Zambia, which is really cool. But it means we really have to work with them because it's like very high security. There's a lot of guys with guns to guard against poachers. And so we have to like work with them and make sure we're going to the right spots and that they know where we are. We're not there to hunt the rhinos. Um, but so here's Zambia, just again, this is a map of the country. And these are the national parks that already exist in Zambia. And so when we go, we're either right here between the national parks or in this one called the North Luongo National Park. And so it's just really important to remember that, you know, cool dinosaurs and cool fossils or something you might see on the news, especially if it's from other parts of the world, you know, there's all these other layers of how scientists and people have to work together and, and um, you know, figure out what our common goals are and help each other out. So we get all kinds of help from these people when we're there. And that's just, you know, because they want to support the same kind of stuff we do. And it's just really cool um, to have all those layers of um, cooperation. Anyway, here's pictures from our teams for the last couple of years um, and all the different places we got our money from, like NSF and National Geographic. And that's a little monkey that's eating a lemon that came out of one of our drinks. So she's having a good time. Brandon, uh, you do and, have a you do have a couple of questions and um, our coworker Jesse wants to know if you need a field cook and we've all had Jesse's food so I would highly recommend taking him. <laughs> oh, so, okay, we'll do Jesse first. So I would Jesse, like to go but um, I'm not sure what I can offer. <laughs> so Jesse, uh, the picture on the, on the bottom and on the top both have two cooks in them each so we always actually do expense our cooks. They are Pretty fun people to hang out with, but you know, we can always talk. <laughs> we are paying for it every time. Uh, can you shower there? Or is the water like river your bathing water? Ooh, so only recently did we invest in a sun shower, which if you know what that is, it's just a big bag that you fill with water and then it sits in the sun all day and gets hot. And then at the end of the day, you can like, you know, just gravity spray yourself with water. But usually it's just, it's dry there. So you're, you kind of get, you know, you're not sweaty and grimy. Your sweat evaporates. You feel gross after like a week or two. And that's like that picture I showed you guys where like I got in the watering hole. It was like because I couldn't take it anymore and it had been so long. We don't usually just swim in the rivers though. One, because the big rivers for sure have crocodiles. And two, because the smaller rivers are probably fine. Probably fine. But there's just occasionally maybe some kind of parasite that we're all scared of. So we don't do it. 
<laughs> um, how long is the plane ride? Oh man, well, it depends on how you go. So I've gone to Zambia, if we just talk about Zambia anyway, a couple of ways. One way, it was when I used to live in Seattle. I flew from Seattle to New York City, which is already like, uh, and then I got on a plane from New York City all the way to South Africa, and then from South Africa up to Zambia. And so the South Africa plane ride is like, mm, 14 hours or something, or 15 hours from New York City. But when I've gone the last couple times, it's actually been really fun. I also left from Seattle, but you can do it from Chicago too, another place I used to be. You go from Seattle and Chicago and you fly to the Middle East, you fly to Dubai. That's actually one of the best ways to do it now. So you totally skip Europe, you totally skip the East Coast. You go up over the North Pole, down Russia. So you don't go like across Europe, you go like up over the planet and you come straight down to the Middle East and you land in Dubai, which is on the Persian Gulf, right across from Iran and right near Saudi Arabia. It's totally a cool place. And then you fly from Dubai down to Africa and you fly over like Ethiopia and Somalia. And it's really cool because if you fly that way, every time I've done it, if you sit on the right side of the plane, you can look out and see Mount Kilimanjaro when you fly over Tanzania. So the big volcano that's in Africa. And so you just gotta be smart when you're flying those flights, you sit on the right side of the plane and see all the cool stuff. Um, but the flights to Dubai from the, from the US, oh boy, 15 or 16 hours for sure every time but it's so cool that they're so i kind of love it because every plane now that flies international is just loaded though especially those kind of flights loaded with movies so i just watch like six movies i didn't see in the movie theater and then i'm there you know have some food take a little nap and then you're in the middle east and you can say what's up have you gotten a parasite from a trip oh what a question um i had one tick that kind of got in there and i got it out um but i've never had a parasite we have to take a lot of medicine, right? Like the first time I went, I had to get a bunch of shots. You'd have to take the same shots if you went to, you know, Indonesia or Brazil and the Amazon or something. It's not just Africa. But, you know, there's, 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 there's um, certain sicknesses like fevers, yellow fever and stuff like that that are parts of the world that we don't usually get in the U.S., which is really lucky for us. Um, but the one thing we all have to do all the time is take medicine for malaria because there are mosquitoes. Uh, that are there that can carry malaria. Luckily, we're going in the dry season. So when it's really dry and really hot, there's really not that many mosquitoes. Um, but we have to take them. And then the other thing is, um, why am I forgetting what it's called? African sleeping sickness, which is a pretty intense uh, thing that can happen when you get bit by these things called tsetse flies. And tsetse flies are kind of like horse flies. They fly around, they got a big nasty spike on their mouth and they plunge it into your skin and suck your blood like a mosquito. But it doesn't like, sometimes you get bit by a mosquito and you didn't realize it, you go, oh, and you slap it later. With a tsetse fly, you know right away because it hurts. And so almost any tsetse fly doesn't have the disease. And so I've been bitten by tsetse flies a bunch of times and I've never had it. But it's always something we have to be like, uh, when you get back for like a month, when you're back home for a month, you have to always be like, am I too tired? Do I have a headache? And then you gotta go to the doctor if you do. Are there any animal you're hoping to see in Africa that you've not seen? Uh, yes, all the time. So Zambia is actually great. Like most of the animals I bet you guys could ask about, we've seen them there. So the rhin white rhinoceros, the, well, not in Zambia actually, not the white rhinoceros, the black rhinoceros, the elephants, the lions, the leopards, the giraffes, the zebras, the buffalo. We got all those, the crocodiles. You know what I want to see? I want to see an aardvark and I want to see a pangolin. And if you don't know what a pangolin or an aardvark is, Go to your Google machine and type in those animals. We're always, I'm always looking for those. Um, but we've seen most of the other stuff, you know, all the big monkeys, there's baboons everywhere. There's a lot of good birds too. Oh boy, if we get started on birds. Oh, also a python. I've never seen a python. There's also cobras there. There's four kinds of snakes that can hurt you. There's two spitting cobras, a puff adder, which is pretty much just a rattlesnake without a rattle. And then the black mamba, which is the only thing that actually scares me a lot. Because if a black mamba really bites you, then you just die. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. So we're always worried about those. But um, I would love to see a python because I just think pythons are cool. Last time we went, um, we saw a chameleon in a tree and I'd never seen a chameleon before. And it was like asleep, but it was trying to be a leaf. But it was like the wrong color green. It was really funny. It was like just the wrong shade. So it was super obvious. And we're like, I can see that chameleon from 50 feet away because it just isn't the right green. I think that's funny. But yeah, I hadn't seen a chameleon before that. Anonymous attendee has a chameleon. Good for you. I wonder if it's a, is it a flat neck chameleon? Because that's the kind that lives in Zambia. Um, anyway. Those are good questions.
Yeah, those are great questions. And we've gone over time. Yes, um, but that was really fun, Brandon. Oh, oh no. Bailey. Okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that was really, really fun. So yeah, good. Yeah, we're gonna have to um end our live for today, but thank you, Brandon. Um yeah. thank you everyone for attending. Um and let's go out and have a nice weekend. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Bye. Everybody. Bye.